Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to this webinar on market sentiment. My name is Martin Essex, and I'm an analyst and editor here at Daily FX. Um, as those of you who've been here before know that I trade using a mixture of fundamentals and technicals, uh, plus a, some uh, global politics and, uh, of course, sentiment, which is what we're here today to talk about. Um, my personal views, not necessarily the views of Daily FX or indeed of our parent company, IG. So before we go any further, I have to show you a risk disclaimer. So if you wouldn't mind reading that, I'd be grateful. And if you have any questions, then please feel free to ask them and I'll try and answer them over the course of this podcast. Um, let me know, please, if you can hear me, because that would be a good start. And um, I'll start, as usual, by going into the um, the charts of all the major assets and tell you what I think is going on. And then we'll look at the calendar and all the sentiment indicators on the calendar. So let's go first to the charts. And um, well, you hardly need me to tell you, I think, that um, it's uh, oh, thanks very much for telling me that uh, you can hear me, which is good. Well, what's been happening, and this is a chart of the euro against the dollar, um, is essentially quite simple. Um, Washington decided to label Beijing a currency manipulator um, and said it would severely damage international financial order and cause chaos in the financial markets. So there you go. Um, China very unhappy with Washington. Um, very unhappy that it's been labeled a currency manipulator. Um, and the, the cause of all this was essentially that um, China allowed its currency, the yuan, to weaken past the seven per dollar level. And that's what led the US to label Beijing a currency manipulator. Um, so it's been pretty hectic in the financial markets with um, uh, safe havens in demand and uh, uh, the riskier assets like stocks heading southwards rather fast. What we've seen today, however, is a bit of a let up. Now, whether this is um, uh, whether this means that the route is over, I very much doubt. But what at least we are seeing is a, is a bounce. We're seeing that things maybe aren't um, quite as bad as the markets were thinking yesterday and uh, and on uh, Friday. So you, what you can see here, looking at the euro dollar chart, and remember that the dollar is the ultimate safe haven these days. Um, we can see that the, the um, uh, the euro here um, rising steadily against the dollar, which I guess is not what you'd expect, is it? Um, so we have this, uh, this is a daily chart, by the way, of the euro against the dollar. So what we saw here was this steep fall um, in the euro that came on Wednesday, bit of stability, sharp rise on Monday, and now gone down a bit on Tuesday. Now, as I said, that's not really what you'd expect, is it? You wouldn't, ex you'd expect people to be rushing into the dollar as a safe haven and then you expect to see some stability but that's certainly not what's happened with this very big rise here in the euro so let's have a look at the dollar basket and see if that gives us a better idea of what's going on um, and here you can see the dollar going down and down and down against this basket of currencies of the of the us's main trading partners so no safe haven demand for the dollar here which as i said is is rather surprising as as people have been talking about the um uh, the dollar as the new safe haven well not here it's not um I must say, incidentally, just if you'll pardon the advertisement, I did suggest that, that this was a, um, a symmetrical triangle pattern. And after a recent rise, you'd expect it to, to jump by around this amount, which is about two points here with the triangles at its widest. And indeed, we have jumped by about two points. So I suppose having reached the target, I should say, well, you know, I did get that about right. Now it's fallen back again. Um, so, as I said, pardon the uh, advertisement, but I did write that. <laughs> um, so let's try and find out what is going on. So let's have a look at the two traditional safe havens, the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc. So let's have a look first at the dollar against the yen. Now, this, to me, this sharp drop in the dollar here over the last few sessions, now that suggests to me that the yen is now back to its safe haven role. So 
we were thinking a while back that the dollar was the new safe haven. Well, this would certainly suggest that's not the case. And maybe because the dollar, the US is so tied up in this trade war, I don't know. But anyway, here we see the money going into the Japanese yen, traditional safe haven. Uh, and we saw this start again, on, uh, when was this? This was Thursday, of course. Um, Thursday, Friday, uh, continuing on Monday, and then a bit of a bounce today. Now, I can't reiterate enough. Um, it has bounced today, but you can see here, it hasn't bounced very strongly. And that suggests to me that, well, possibly we're not at the end yet of this, um, of these renewed concerns about the US-China trade war. Um, Beijing, you could say, started this off by allowing the Yuan to weaken, but um, uh, you, you could also argue that, well, it was Donald Trump that started it. So take your pick. So that's the, the dollar against the yen. And let's have a look at the dollar against the Swiss franc, which uh, is here. And you see exactly the same picture here. So this is people diving into Swiss francs, the other major safe haven, before a little bit of a bounce. So absolutely identical looking at those two. Um, US-China trade war, as I said, um, renewed concerns. I mean, it was only uh, well, really at the beginning of last week that people were saying, oh, you know, that's a background factor now. People aren't too concerned about the China, US China trade war. Well, they are. They are still concerned about it. And that really shows up here where we see this money plowing into the yen and Swiss franc and indeed other assets. I'll talk about those later. I suppose one reason why the dollar is is hasn't benefited from this is because it puts more fresh pressure on the US Federal Reserve to ease interest rates. Um, that might be one reason why people are moving out of dollars. Um, but we are seeing these um, these moves. And let me just have a quick skim through some of the other um, currencies. Uh, let's look at the Australian dollar. Now we see the Australian dollar as the, the, the ultimate risk on assets. So when risk is off, you tend to see the Australian dollar fall. And that just simply shows, well, the US dollar is down, but the Australian dollar is down by a lot more. Very weak Australian dollar. Um, again, a tiny little bounce today, but will it last? Well, <sighs> Possibly, possibly not. And the Reserve Bank of Australia did leave its interest rates unchanged. Um, while I'm here, let's have a quick look at the Kiwi as well. So this is the New Zealand dollar against the US dollar. So this is another risk on asset effectively. And you can see it's gone down and down and down and down. Bit of a rally, but actually today down again. And um, uh, again, this is, I suppose, at least in part towards uh, about interest rates. Uh, what else is have a look at? Well, let's have a look at the Aussie against the yen. Um, again, as you would expect, a weak Australian dollar, a strong Japanese yen, and we're seeing this absolutely regular risk off trade. If we're at risk is off, sell the Australian dollar against the Japanese yen. If you haven't, well, conceivably it's too late. I mean, look at this little bounce here, um, but it could easily escalate and we could easily see more problems there. Um, let's have a look. What else is we have a look at? Shall we have a look at the um, at sterling, I suppose, as we normally do, if I can find it. Where's uh, sterling gone here? There we are. Um, flat. So in other words, as the US dollar has gone down, so, so has sterling. Um, You'll know, I'm sure, that, that this is all about Brexit still. Um, the, the, we saw this extraordinary drop in sterling, uh, quite an extraordinary drop, and then just a little bit of stability over the last few days. Let me try and come into a weekly on this and show you the big picture on this, because I think it's interesting. So we can go all the way back here to the Brexit referendum. So this was back in uh, June 2016, and this tumble in sterling that really gathered steam uh, last week um, and indeed for a couple of weeks before that. So we are now down in sterling right back to these levels that we last saw back in uh, in uh, January 2017 and uh, almost at its low point since that Brexit referendum. This low point was reached here back in October 2016. So 
incredible weakness here on sterling. Um, it's hit all the newspapers in the UK. And from a contrarian perspective, I would say that uh, once the, the non-specialist media begin talking about this, um, uh, it's it's time to move in the other direction. Um, I've just been asked by James, can you explain what risk on and risk off is and why it happens? Simply, it, it is reasonably straightforward. It means that when um, people are worried, um, they go into haven assets, those assets that are seen as safest, like US Treasury bonds and gold and uh, the yen and the Swiss franc. When they're happier, they go into more volatile assets like stock markets and uh, indeed currencies like the Australian dollar. So that's what uh, risk on means. Risk on means investors are, are willing to buy riskier assets. Risk off means they're looking for more um, uh, stable assets, assets that are, are seen as safe havens. Um, Let's move on from currencies then um, to the rest of the markets. Um, I want to show you quickly this chart. It's not on our site. It's on investing.com. And this is US 10-year Treasury yield. Now, US Treasuries are another safe haven. They're another thing that people buy when um, they're a bit worried about what's going on. Uh, US Treasuries, German bonds, to more safe havens. People tend when they when when times are bad and they're a bit worried about things that they tend to go from equities into bonds. So when people are moving into bonds, uh, it makes sense the yield down. And here you can see that's exactly what happens. The yield has gone down, 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 down before a little bit of a bounce today, as with all the other markets. But you can see here it's up only seven basis points today. So really nothing much to write home about, not much of a bounce. Um, that's that. As I said, let's have a look at some of the other assets. So I'll go back to the IG charts here and uh, let's have a look at what's happening to commodities because I know a lot of you are interested in what's happening to gold and oil and this is gold. Um, well, a very strong performance here by gold. Uh, this low point back in, let's see when it was, this recent low, I should say, was back towards the end of May this year. So June, July, both pretty good months for um, for gold, as you would expect. And again, a, a, a little chart pattern that worked well here. You see this little pennant formation here. So price went up, little pennant formation, and um, you can see it broke to the upside, uh, steady, then broke to the upside again. So again, a, a little chart pattern that did actually work rather well. Anyway, gold price, um, well over $1,400 an ounce now, um, not all that far from $1,500, but uh, let's wait and see for that one, whether that happens. And um, silver, um, no, let's not look at silver, let's look at oil. Um, because people are worried about um, global demand, because obviously if we get a trade war, um, it, it's likely to be bad for the global economy. That means that demand is likely to go down. And here, I think this is what we're seeing. This is the US crude oil price, West Texas Intermediate. Um, and here you can see it's really not doing very well. It's struggling. I mean, it's not dropping sharply. Um, but equally, it, we did see this big drop that came on. When was this? This was Thursday. And it's just been sort of stable since then, but not a very strong outlook for oil, as you'd expect if people are worried about the global economy. And Brent crude, um, weaker. I mean, Brent crude hasn't really shown that same sort of stability. This is the global benchmark. And here you can see several successive days of falling prices. People worry about the economic background. I'll just show you a couple of others that I don't normally look at. Copper, of course, is is uh, reacts very quickly to the economic background. Um, again, because copper is a metal that's used in industry. And uh, when um, people are worried that, that demand is falling, they tend to sell copper and vice versa. So here we see a pretty steep fall in the price of copper, which I, I don't like talking about recession. I think that a recession is possible, but not hugely likely. Um, but still, global demand does look as though it's weakening, and that's weakening the copper price. And iron ore, another metal that depends very much on global demand. Here you can see this even steeper fall here in the iron ore price. So these are all suggesting that 
global economic, or they're all suggesting global economic weakness and perhaps leading to lower demand for oil and copper and iron ore and so forth. I might as well show you Bitcoin because uh, one of you in particular always tells me off when I don't. Uh, Bitcoin is moving strongly ahead again. Um, I don't think that Bitcoin reacts to the normal rules of supply and demand because it's traded on a whole bunch of different platforms. It's never quite clear what it is that's influencing the gold price, but uh, sorry, the Bitcoin price. But here it is moving ahead really quite strongly again and not all that far off these highs that we saw back in late June. Right, stock markets. Um, so the flip side of risk on, risk off is risk off means that stock markets dive and indeed they are. So this is money that's going out of riskier assets like stocks into less risky assets like gold, coming up with these very strong drops on Wall Street. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the top 30 industrial stocks in America. Um, we see this really steep fall. Um, but uh, today, well, the market's not open today, but this is the uh, this is what's happening so far um, uh, off the market. Um, uh, and so here you see um, a bit of a bounce that means that Wall Street is likely to open higher when indeed it does open. Um, still, I mean, a very dramatic fall yesterday and uh, more falls in the preceding days. And that's true of the wider US stock market as well. Um, here you see the, the S&P 500, so that's the 500, um, uh, top 500, S&P 500 stocks falling back as well. This is true in Europe as well, as you'd expect. I mean, European markets do tend to follow Wall Street. This is the FTSE 100. Um, forgive me for repeating this because I do every week. The FTSE 100 is not, it, although it's London listed stocks, it's not a measure of the UK economy. Um, it's a measure of the international economy because there's so many banks in it and mining stocks and so on. And here you see, again, this really quite precipitous fall before of a bit of a rebound. And that's true across much of uh, Europe as well. So let's have a look at France. Same picture, Germany. Well, you get the picture. I won't show you too many others. I'll show you Spain and Italy as well. That's Spain, and this is Italy. All very much the same story. Um, question from Robert um, Do you look at supply and demand in FX trading? N no, not really. Um, I mean, quite clearly, if a currency is in demand, its price will go up. And if a price is not, in, and if a currency is not in demand, its price will go down. But you tend to look not at these, you, it tends not to be framed in this way. And when you're analyzing a currency, you're looking at um, uh, economic data and interest rates and what central bankers are saying and so forth. So it doesn't quite work in the same way in FX as it does in assets like stocks and bonds and commodities. Let's have a look at the calendar. Um, and um, I have to say it's not a busy week for um, for data. Um, there really isn't much on the menu this week. What we have seen, indeed, we've pretty much seen already. I'll just run through the data that we had yesterday. Um, if you're new to this, let me explain again. As far as I'm concerned, looking at the official data is like um, driving your car by looking in the rear view mirror. It tells you about what has happened. A lot of the um, unofficial data is forward-looking and therefore gives you a better idea of what's coming up rather than what's already happened. I'm not suggesting that you ignore the official data and I'm certainly not suggesting that you look only at the forward-looking data, but still it's it's interesting and I think useful. So we've got a whole number of purchasing managers indexes yesterday. Um, in, these are, these are um, I think if you're looking at market sentiment, you need to look at trading sentiment, but also on business sentiment and consumer sentiment, industrial sentiment, and so on. So that's why the PMIs are interesting. This is where purchasing managers, people who buy stuff for their companies, are asked about um, uh, how they see things. And these are answers. Now, we saw the Japanese PMI yesterday, but note these are final figures. The markets tend to move on the advanced figures, not on the final figures. Um, and indeed, as in Japan, these were 
not really market moving. Ditto China, we saw the, uh, sorry, not Ditto China, these were fresh figures. This is something called the Kaijin China PMI. And we saw um, the both the services figure and the composite figure. Now note here that the services figure was weaker than expected. It was expected to be unchanged at 52. It was actually bit lower at 51.6. So the service sector in China not doing as well as analysts had predicted, but still well over 50. So well over the, the, the 50 mark, that's the difference between um, uh, expansion and contraction. So the Japanese services sector is still expanding, but by a little bit less than people were expecting. And note that this composite one, services and manufacturing is it was a little bit higher as well than previously then we've got a whole raft of European PMIs Italy France Germany and then the eurozone as a whole and I'm about to have a sneeze so excuse me sorry about that um, right so again the, these were largely final figures. The Italy ones were new, but France were final figures and Germany were final figures and the Eurozone as a whole were final figures. But do note that there was a very marginal markdown in the um, Eurozone services PMI. So uh, all really feeding into this picture of things are really a little bit worrying at the moment. Um, one other figure that we saw yesterday was this thing called the um, uh, the Centix, and that's down here, um, and it was at 8.30, I think. Um, so here we see the Eurozone Centix Investor Confidence Index, and you can see that investors, I think, were very, well, unconfident that's not a word i know but you know what i mean um so never mind the actual figures it's how it compares with what was expected that's important the figure previously was minus 5.8 expected to be down to minus 7 it was actually down to minus 13.7 so an interesting figure that it suggests that um, investor confidence was really much poorer in the last few days than than it was expected to be um, UK PMIs we saw, um, and these are preliminary figures, not um, uh, final figures. And note that these both came in above expectations, both services and composite. And, and these are both well over the 50 level. So note that the services PMI came in higher than expected and well above that 50 mark. And the composite PMI are back above 50. It was expected to be up just a tad to 49.8. It's now 50.7, which means that the um, UK economy as a whole, if you look at these figures, is actually beginning to expand again, which is good. And then finally, we saw the US PMIs here. These were again final figures, so don't pay too much attention to them. That was yesterday. Nothing much today, just one figure. So I'll just come into this that I want to note. Um, the Japanese leading indicator that came out. So they do, the, the Japanese produce this thing called the coincident index and the leading index, um, provisional figures, um, a little bit historic, but note that while the coincident index was as expected by analysts, the um, leading index was a little bit lower. So not good news there. So all in all, I would say that what we've seen so far has been not very good news from this sort of data. And um, I won't go through the rest of the week because frankly, there isn't very much to look at in the way of forward looking private sector data coming up. Right, the fear and greed index. So this, as it says, if you can read it, is the CNN business fear and greed index. What emotion is driving the markets now? tracks seven indicators of investor sentiment. And there you can see it's way down in extreme fear territory. So this is risk on risk off again. Um, this is simply saying that um, investors are looking for haven assets. They're looking for the safety of gold and treasury bonds and so forth. They're not looking to buy riskier assets like stocks. All fits in with the story I've been telling you so far. Um, Bit of a bounce? Well, mm, not yet. I mean, look at these figures. Month ago, 61. Week ago, 58. Previous close, 36. And latest close, 22. This was yesterday's data. Um, so 
the markets are really, really in risk off mode. Um, my guess is it might pick up a little bit today, seeing as we've seen a little bit of bounce in the markets today, but it's in severe risk off territory. I want to look at our own data. So um, our website hasn't been working very well, so I hope um, I can show you this. Um, oh, it's worked back up, that's good. So IG client sentiment data. Daily FX's parent company is called IG. IG uh, provides a platform for traders to trade. Um, we look at the aggregated data, whether the retail traders using the IG platform are currently long or short, how heavily they're long or short, and how whether they are more long or more short than they were previously. And we sort of stick those figures into a machine and turn the handle and out comes a bit out comes a contrarian signal if the markets are very long and getting longer that for us is a sell signal so let's just have a look at what these signals are saying bearish the euro against the dollar um interesting bearish the euro against the dollar but bullish the dollar against the no bearish the dollar against the yen so interesting so in other words this euro dollar expecting a stronger dollar, dollar yen expecting a weaker dollar. So people are, so, so this data suggests that the euro could actually be a bit lower against the dollar, whereas the yen will continue to pick up its safe haven bid. Um, not a clear signal on gold, which is perhaps a little bit surprising, a mixed signal on gold, bearish again for sterling. Well, you could say, you know, it, pays not to try and catch a falling knife and sterling is dropping like a stone so i'm not surprised that's giving us a bearish signal so bearish for sterling and um, bullish for the yen i think fits in with the overall picture i've been painting uh, bearish for the s p 500 so bearish for stock markets this all of all suggests to me that despite the bit of a bounce we're seeing at the moment we're not out of the woods yet and things are still actually really not that good if you um james you go with the opposite of what it's saying yes indeed exactly no i don't get the, uh, i take a contrarian view on this uh, indeed at daily fx we're taking contrarian view but these signals are the signals that that contrarian data are showing us this is suggesting a bearish signal on dollar yen bearing in mind what's going on um, in the data at the moment. So clients long 71%, clients short 29%. So the market is massively long dollar yen and that's what's giving us a bearish signal. So it's a, it's a contrarian view and this is a, this is a, a signal. Um, I can't reiterate too much, I wouldn't go with this only. You have to look at the fundamentals, you have to look at the technicals, you have to look at everything else. But this is one more thing to, to put into the mix when you're deciding what to buy and sell. If you want more details, I'm running out of time, so I won't show you this. At the top right hand corner of all of our pages, sign up or log into Daily FX Plus, and there you can see reports that give you a lot more detail, much more detail on all of this. Um, Finally, as always, please read our education section because I get too many emails from people saying they've lost money and what should they do now uh, too late. Um, read the education section before you start trading. If you're new, you could look at all this beginners, intermediate, advanced. There's lots of materials there. You might also want to open a demo account before you risk real money. But bear in mind that the psychology is different. If you're not trading real money, then the psychology is slightly different, but still in all, read the education material, um, open a, a tr a, an account where it's not real money, you're just, just you know, pretending before you do the real thing. Um, that's about it for me. I've uh, pretty much run out of time, so I hope you have a good trading week, and if you can join me next week, that would be really good. So goodbye for now.